So remember when it's coming to NMR, we've got four primary categories that we need to be looking at. We talked about the number of signals. We'll look at chemical shift in this section, integration, and then multiplicity, all kind of jam-packed into hopefully less than 30 minutes because there won't be any questions. Um, so again, your number of signals or your number of unique atoms. I think it makes sense at this point to just build a structure, point to an atom, close your eyes, rotate, flip, spin, all that fun stuff. If you can find the exact same atom, then it's unique, move on to the next one. And you'll do that for every atom that corresponds to whatever NMR you're looking at, be it HNMR or carbon NMR. So for some structures in your HNMR, that's going to be pointing to a lot of different atoms. You should get used to that practice with the models so that you can actually do this correctly. I'm pretty sure I butchered the homotopic and antiotopic and diastereotopic aspects from the last class. Don't stress about it. It's not a big deal. Um, definitely won't test on that. So now into chemical shift. Okay, well, the whole point of chemical shift is that our hydrogens uh, can be shielded by electrons. So those electrons can protect it and prevent it from seeing the external magnet or uh, they're removed from that atom, in which case the external magnet is now more visible. So the big kind of rule of thumb here is this table shown up top. Okay, well, this is super kind of important. Really, all you need to recognize is that if you remove electrons, you shift to higher frequencies or a larger chemical shift value. If you have a bunch of electrons present around your hydrogen, they move to the right. Okay? And in and of itself, it isn't that big a deal. Uh, what I would recommend you memorize would actually be this next slide where it goes through and says some particular chemical shift ranges. There's kind of a typo in my slides. This range right here is just like the everything else range up there. And I'm not saying that that range isn't useful. It is exceptionally useful. However, there's so many different things that fall in that range that students are prone to overanalyze it. Much the same thing happened with IR. When we look at IR, do it quick. Okay, they should be really fast kind of approaches. So if we double back and take a look at these two molecules, what would be the difference between them? And this is where chemical shift plays a much larger role. Because if we go through and look, we've got three hydrogens over here. Three hydrogen, or sorry, two hydrogens here, and then we have three hydrogens here. Okay, so as far as uniqueness, those are all unique from each other. And if we go through and do it on the other side, we'd end up seeing something pretty similar. We get three signals. Okay, we could go through and evaluate the other levels of HNMR. Um, or the more difficult ones, and we'd find that there is no way to distinguish these things based on those four main principles. The number of signals are the same. We'll deal with chemical shift in a second. The integration, we'll deal with that a little bit, but they're the same between these. And the multiplicity will end up being the same. So the only way to differentiate these two molecules has to be chemical shift. And if we went through and used the principles that we talked about or I told you to memorize, you wouldn't actually be able to identify it because none of these hydrogens really stand out. Okay? And so that's where we have to go through and use the kind of rule outlined up here. When we go through and take a look at, say, that first structure, okay, these orange hydrogens are the closest to an electronegative element. That electronegative element withdraws electrons towards it. That means those hydrogens have less electrons around them, which then means they are de-shielded. Right, by being de-shielded, I would expect the signal for them to show up the furthest downfield, so the largest Uh, chemical shift value should correspond to them. If I go through and take a look at the other molecule, well, notice the location of the oxygen has changed. These red hydrogens are now closer. This is the one that should have the largest chemical shift. Okay. 
in and of itself, that doesn't help us out because we don't know how to distinguish these three things from each other yet because we haven't looked at integration and multiplicity. But what we can do is recognize that that is the difference. The way these two compounds will differentiate, differentiate, ah, differentiate each other is solely based on the chemical shift. And we now have to find either a 2H that is shifted to the largest value or a 3H that is shifted to the largest value. All right, so there's a 3H signal or a 2H signal, which kind of sets us up for integration. So let's jump to integration. Well, in integration, we're given the ratio of hydrogens within our compound. So what we could do is look at the area underneath the curve. For those of you that have taken calculus, that's what integration means. Okay, integration is literally the area under the curve. And so if we go through and look at the area underneath each of these potential curves, we could then go through and compare that area and come up with a ratio between those. Okay? Depending on how nice your potential instructors are, uh, because you may not always have me, uh, you may see the integration information provided in a variety of different forms. Okay? The simplest method would be to list out right next to it, say, 2H. That's now saying that the signal closest to it has two hydrogens embedded in it. The next one would be a 1H, and the next one would likely be a 3H. Okay? Potentially even more, because the which we'll get into in the next part. Um, the other option is you may see these weird kind of zigzaggy lines kind of float, whoops, I did that one poorly, kind of float over the top of each of your signals. Okay. And what those are is, again, literally an integration. They're saying that there is an area, a non-zero area in that space. So what you would go through and do is bust out a ruler and measure the height of those peaks and now turn that into a ratio. Okay. So this is really getting us kind of an empirical formula. Empirical, well, oh my gosh, whatever, empirical formula for hydrogens. Okay, it is our reduced ratio, not necessarily the exact number of hydrogens. So we could then go through and compare that way. Yet another way that you could potentially see that information written would be numbers underneath each of the peaks. So we could see it as 2, 1, 3. We could also potentially see it as 4, 2, 6. So if you don't see a reduced ratio, what might be happening is your instructor's being really nice and telling you how many hydrogens are actually there instead of an empirical formula. It is also possible they're just being really mean and they're providing you the non-reduced ratio expecting you to determine it. Okay. The last way that I'll mention just because it's a historic one is that you could then take your spectra, you could zoom in equally to each of these signals, you could bust out some scissors and cut out the peaks, okay? and then you could go through and weigh the pieces of paper. You then have another ratio. You could compare the weights of each of those pieces of paper each other to come up with this ratio. Okay? So all of those methods are better than the last method. The last method is the one that the ACS exam, for some unknown reason to me, has decided you should be using. Okay, which is technically a horrible method, but here it is. Okay? We look at our structures or our spectra, and we'd say, well, this first one is really tall, so it must mean it has more hydrogens. This one's really short, this is something in between, so I just kind of estimate out some numbers. As a ballpark estimation, that's not horrible. However, we can't determine the integration or the area under a curve by just looking at the peak. Okay? Because if I take a look at a signal like this versus a signal like this, well, now the one on the right looks like it has more area, but the one on the left has all of this area, which is now more than the one on the right. 
area isn't just height, it's also base. So if you're going to go through and do this, be very wary that you have to watch out for the base of each of those signals messing with your numbers. Okay, Just be aware of it. That's about all I'm asking out of it. Okay, um, For our sake, for any test that you have to take or any assignment that I give you, I will give you the integration information unless I accidentally forgot to give it to you, in which case, let me know. Okay, So again, the ratio of hydrogens. So back to our previous example, if we can go all the way back, this spectra, or the spectra for these, we had three hydrogens, we had two hydrogens, and we had three hydrogens. So what we would be doing is looking for a two hydrogen integration that was the largest chemical shift. If we looked at the other one, three hydrogen, two hydrogen, three hydrogen, I'm looking for a three hydrogen shift that was the largest chemical shift. Would it be different than the blue one? Well, yes, the reason why it would be different from the blue one is the blue one is near these two hydrogens, whereas the red one is not near any hydrogens. What does that mean? Well, that actually takes us into our next level. The next level is now multiplicity. Hydrogens are magnets, and if those magnets are close enough to each other, they will interact with each other. So what is close enough? That is our three bond rule. Unequivalent hydrogens are neighbors if they are within three bonds of each other. Okay, A lot of people like to say it has to be three. That is not true. It has to be within three bonds. So it is very possible to have a hydrogen that is only two bonds away that is a neighbor. Okay, Which is a tricky statement to make, but it's true. After that, what does that mean? Okay, well, what we would do is take the number of neighbors in our structure, and I would add one to it. This will equal now the number of peaks. That says neighbors, just in case you are wondering. Okay, and then we could go through and say, well, how many peaks do we see for that individual signal? Okay, so that's kind of a neat little process. Where that's coming from, if you're interested in it, you can deal with magnets. Okay. Because these are magnets aligning with a field, they can be either up or down. If I bring in a second hydrogen, that second hydrogen could align up. It could also align down, which means I get four possible states that could have come out of this. Some of these are copies of each other, like those two are the same, and these two are the same, which is why we get two peaks with one neighbor. Okay, it's our possible states. You don't like the arrows, don't worry about the arrows. Not a big deal. Okay, the next kind of part that goes with the multiplicity is the shape of your individual peaks. Because this isn't just an arbitrary, well I have two peaks, so they're just random heights. They are very, very particular in their intensities. So that's the shape system that we're seeing over here. With zero neighbors, you will get a signal. With one neighbor, you get a signal as well, but that signal splits into two peaks of equal intensity. So the number represents the relative intensity. With two neighbors, what happens? Well, I get three peaks. Two peaks of the same intensity and the middle one of twice the intensity. Okay, this is known as, I believe, Pascal's triangle. If you're interested in it, you can look it up. Okay, but your peak shapes or your splitting patterns will always be symmetric. Okay, So what would that mean if we doubled all the way back again? Well, let's double back all the way back to our problem back here. And let's take a look at how our three H's were different from each other. Okay, we'll pick the one on the right. We had a 3H and a 3H. Okay, well, this blue one has two hydrogens as a neighbor, which means the signal for my three hydrogen blue should turn into three peaks. Those three peaks can be known as a triplet 
because the peaks are tied to each other. What would happen to the red one? Well, the red one is near only an oxygen, and the oxygen technically hides hydrogens, so I'd never be able to see beyond it anyway, okay? But there's no hydrogens there, so there's no neighbors, okay? Because there are no neighbors, I get only one peak, okay? That one peak, since it's all by itself, gets known as a singlet, okay? So there's kind of some terms that go along with it, singlet, doublet, triplet, quartet, pentet, hextet, heptet, octet, nonet, decet. Those names should sound familiar because those are the same names we used back in nomenclature. Once you get beyond about six or seven peaks, it becomes virtually impossible to distinguish how many peaks are there. And so we get lazy, or not really lazy, we just can't, literally can't tell, and we end up calling it a multiplet, meaning a bunch of peaks that I can't see. Okay. That does make analysis a little bit more difficult, but you don't have to analyze it right away. You could leave the multiplicity alone and double back when you had a little bit more information to actually solidify and explain why you saw something. Okay, So let's ignore that long distance thing, because that's just frustrating for the moment, Okay, and look at a more difficult concept of splitting, splitting of splitting. If we go through and look at that red hydrogen, okay, and I want to know how many neighbors it has. Okay, well, if I do my three bonds, there's one, two, three, one, two, three, the blue hydrogens contribute two neighbors. If I count the other direction, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, there's another three neighbors. So there's a total of five neighbors here. So if I look at that red hydrogen, I might expect to see a signal because, well, there's a hydrogen there. Okay. Um, add to that now that I have five neighbors, and so we might go through and say that I would expect six peaks. Let's see if I can pull this off. I get six? I think I got six. And we might expect a hextet. Okay, and depending on the situation, we might see that, we might not. It really depends on the strength of the magnet. Okay, so what else could we possibly see? Okay, well that possible thing that we could see depends on how different my hydrogen neighbors are. So one is orange and one is blue, so they're clearly different. Okay? Because I like blue better, I'm going to say blue interacts first. Okay? So what happens? Well, that same red signal then sees those two hydrogens, and so it splits into a triplet. Okay? Three peaks because there's two neighbors. But we also have the three neighbors from the orange. Okay, well, that would mean it needs to split into a quartet, but my signal has already split. That means each of the signals that I have, I have three peaks now, must split okay, into a quartet. So what I'll end up getting is something that looks like this. And for those of you saying, well, that looks like crap, I don't want to have to analyze that. I will, depending on the structure again, you may not have to analyze that. But this is what ends up happening, is if our magnet is strong enough to distinguish that, this is what we should see for that red hydrogen. I mean, that one peak that we talked about, one signal, should turn into this giant mess? Yes. Okay. Typically it does not. Typically what we end up seeing is here, because the magnets that we use aren't strong enough to distinguish the difference between the orange and the blue hydrogens, and so we see one kind of simple signal. Well, how did that bottom signal become that top signal? Okay. We've seen examples of this before. It's overlapping signals. If I can't differentiate those, those signals all start to overlap. As they overlap, they become more intense. In that overlapping process, what we end up seeing 
is that Hextet with the five neighbors. Okay. Super exciting, I know. Okay. Whoa, I'm back here. The last thing that I'll mention there about splitting is sometimes we can hear you'll hear mentioned or see something along the lines of long distance splitting. Okay. This typically happens with our aromatic rings. Aromatic rings will sometimes cause what is long, known as long distance splitting, or at least what I like to refer to as long distance splitting. Because if I look at the connections for those hydrogens, I've shown two blue bonds. A third puts me at a carbon, not at a hydrogen. A fourth puts me at a hydrogen. Well, that's four bonds away, so they shouldn't be neighbors. It turns out that, again, if our magnet is strong enough, those hydrogens can indeed see each other, which means the signal does split, and I do end up seeing a small splitting. Okay, again, this requires a really powerful magnet to detect that difference. Most magnets aren't strong enough, and so we end up not seeing that long-distance splitting. Okay, so we have to have some very particular circumstances. Those circumstances usually seem to hinge on the presence of a pi bond. That pi bond helps kind of shrink the distance to bring those hydrogens close enough to each other that we can actually get an interaction between them. Okay? Which gets us to our last, most confusing concept, which really isn't a big deal, but there's some questions about the homework on it. What we're talking about is how those hydrogens see each other. Said another way, this is the coupling of our hydrogens. Okay? Because it is now constant for an individual molecule, we can refer to it as the coupling constant. So it is the distance then between the peaks that we see within our spectra. Okay? So how big of a spread do we get? If we have hydrogens that couple to each other, the distance between the peaks in each of their respective signals will be identical. So if we want to get super nuanced in our actual spectra and run some crazy calculations, we can go through and say, well, this hydrogen must, or this signal must interact with this signal. That means those hydrogens are close to each other and we can draw some more information. That is awesome and phenomenal and fantastic for anybody that wants to do spectroscopy at a much higher level. Okay? For the level that we're working with, the coupling constant isn't that big a deal. Okay? But the textbook, again, shows it, so you can see the kind of relationships here. What they're talking about, let's take a look at C and D. C and D are neighbors to each other, so if we look at the peak distance between there, we can calculate that out to be 7.6 hertz. If I go through and take a look at D's signal, well, the distance between peaks is again 7.6 hertz. You might say, well, that's a tiny little difference. That can't possibly show up anywhere else. But we notice that if we go through and look at other signals, those other signals, because they aren't being split by C and D, get us a different splitting pattern or a different splitting coupling constant, which is kind of neat. Okay? It is also insanely difficult to look at and find and deal with, but it's there, and under very nuanced conditions, we could actually use that to resolve our structure. And those nuanced conditions really coming down to the difference between cis and trans double bonds. Uh, whoop. So there we go. I was trying to circle them all. So if we were looking at, and even we, we don't need this one, this is the vicinal structure, I think. We don't even need to look at that one officially. But if I'm trying to decide between the cis alkene versus the trans alkene, what I might go through and do is calculate the coupling constants to see what the coupling constants were in the spectra. Because if it's a trans, I would expect a coupling constant in the range of 13 to 18 hertz. If it was cis, I'd expect 7 to 12. Okay? That is neat. It's fascinating. It's cool to use if you would ever need to get there. We typically don't, so I don't want you stressing on it for the exam, because I'm not asking a question about coupling constants on the exam. 
And I don't think you will ever see coupling constants again in your life unless you grow up to be an organic or biochemist working with spectroscopy. Okay? With that, that is now all of the lecture slides for our next exam. So if you've got questions, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I will do my best to answer any questions that I can. I will say that I will push the homework due date back to Tuesday um, from Monday because I'm not there Monday to answer any questions. Okay, I apologize for that inconvenience. I would still recommend you try and get the, the homework done as close to Monday night as possible and not wait till Tuesday. But there it is. Thanks for your time, and I will hopefully see you Wednesday, assuming my son is not still sick.